Let's go back to Romans, Romans 8th chapter. And uh, continuing probably with the book of Romans. Now, nobody take out their cell phones and take pictures, okay? These are pink. Hey, this is going to work. <laughs> I heard you laugh, Bev. <clears throat> but uh, this is the Greens last week with us, too, as well, before they head back down to hurricane country. So, All right. Romans chapter 8, we made it um, up till, I think, the 18th verse. And so, but I just want to remind us, this, this is one of the most encouraging chapters in all of the Bible. It's an awesome chapter because it starts with there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so no condemnation. It gives us the assurance of salvation. It tells you that we are, we even sang the song, Behold what manner of love. That's a Bible verse, by the way. Behold what manner of love the Father's given to us that we should be called the sons of God. It's an awesome thing. And he, he lets us know that assurance, all the, the blessings that we have in Christ. This chapter just goes on and on about <clears throat> uh, the security as well of the believer and so on. Uh, but I'm going to start with verse 18 and or maybe 17 uh, at the end of it there, just so we, or let's start at 16, but we'll go from 18 to a few verses. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. And that's encouraging. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Again, we don't deserve these things, but wow. This chapter just grows and grows. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. He talks about suffering and glorification here. And that's his topic for today as well as we continue this. In verse 18, it begins. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, or <clears throat> the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, and not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. <clears throat> because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in the hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? For if we hope for that which we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. And I'd like to have gone further this week, but I didn't know how we'd get further than this. So I'll just stop there and, and, and we'll continue. But let's start at, at the verse 18 again. <clears throat> for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. <laughs> now, I... I think Paul talked about this stuff a lot. I think he talked about the afterlife a lot because how can you have an eager expectation of it unless you talk about it, unless you pass it on? And, and uh, maybe some of you who are bereaving the loss of a loved one at this time can, can think of this verse and say, how's this possible? How's this possible right now to consider the sufferings of this present time not even worthy, he said, not even to make a comparison worthy of the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so that's where we're going to start. When he's talking about, uh, let me just say that suffering characterizes this life, right? This the time we're talking about right now. That Paul talks about suffering characterizes this life. The life to come is characterized by a word called glory. <laughs> and so that's what he's he's making a difference. He's not just talking about the sufferings of being a believer. And yes, you will be suffer persecution for being a believer, but he's also talking the sufferings in general of life. Illness, right? You experience that? Shirley's in terrible back pain. And I'm sure right now she's probably longing for glory. <laughs> I know Hans's mother 
She can't wait to get there. She, she just had enough of this world and can't wait to meet the Savior face to face. And so in this life of suffering, we have illness, bereavement, hunger, obviously financial loss, and death itself, which we face. You know, I, I was thinking back, you know, just three weeks ago, we talked on the rich man and Lazarus. We talked about eternity, heaven and hell, the reality of those. And then shortly after, we had deaths. And it's just kept that very vivid in my mind, the reality of the life after. And uh, Paul, as we continue in Romans, continues kind of with that topic, too. And literally, the saying goes like this, the sufferings of the now time. The sufferings of the now time. They're painful, but he says they're not worth comparing. Now, hopefully by the time we get to the end, we see why. But right now, he said that you can't even, it's not even worthy to compare the two. In fact, he says, better we contrast them than compare them. Because there's such a big difference between the sufferings of this present life and the glories in heaven. The glories of the afterlife with Christ. Again, speaking here of those who know Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, Paul is talking about, uh, and it's, it's, it's hard to read it after you know what Paul has suffered, how many times he was shipwrecked, right? And, and uh, how many times he was beaten and uh, just the things he, he went through and imprisonments. And he looks in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, he says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. What, what kept brother Paul going? What kept the apostle Paul going through the difficulties of this life? If we think our life is tough, think about Paul's. My goodness, what an example to me and to you, isn't he? And he looked at the sufferings of this present life, and that's what he, he said, they're, they're light afflictions. They're light afflictions, which are but for a moment. And see, why could he say it? Because he, he always remembered, he looked at things from God's perspective, from eternal's perspective. He saw that this life is difficult, there is pain, but he said, come I know they're for a moment. The bereavement that we have over the loss of love is for a moment. It can only last as long as this life is at most. It says, let me read again. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us, not against us, but for us, a far more exceeding and eternal weight in glory. It's almost like he's trying to put the two on a scale. He says, it's not worth doing, but... He says, here you have our afflictions, as bad as they can get. And up here you have the weight of glory. And you, you're just incomparable. And it, these light afflictions, they'll work for us. A far and exceeding eternal weight and glory. Again, I think the way we need to get through difficult times in our life, and I think this is what God's saying, is that you need eternal perspectives. You need to look at things in the light of eternity. I think that's part of the reason Jonathan Edwards who said, Lord, God, stamp eternity on my eyeballs. He wanted to always be conscious of eternity. <clears throat> and so let's go to the next verse. And, and he explains, I think he spends the rest of this part that we're looking at today explaining what he means. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject, subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. You say, what's that all mean? Let's take the first part. <clears throat> Let me just say uh, that man's sin corrupted nature, okay? Our sin back in the Garden of Eden. In fact, hold your place here, but go to Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3. Let's just look at this a moment. He doesn't <clears throat> uh, refer to it. He just uh, takes it as a fact that most people understand this. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17. This is after man fell. He took the fruit that God had told him not to. In the garden, you know, one rule, one rule, and we couldn't keep it. And Adam fell into sin and Eve. And in verse 17, of chapter 3, Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree, of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. 
Cursed is the ground for your sake. Okay, that's the key. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth from for you. And you shall eat the bread, eat the herb of the field. In the sweat and the dust, er, in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread <clears throat> till you return to the ground. For out of it you, ca- you were taken. Uh, for dust you are, and to dust you return. This is the this life he's talking about now. Ever since the fall of man, something happened that affected not only mankind. I think often we think of Adam's sin affected humankind. But did you realize, maybe for the first time today, that it affected all of creation? Behold, man's sin affected all of creation. The ground was cursed. And he talked about these different <clears throat> things that happened that uh, we just read. He says the creation, the earnest expectation of the creation, that means God made it, right? There had to be an, a maker of it. <clears throat> but right now creation is under the bondage of corruption, it says here. Bondage of corruption. What's that? It decays, doesn't it? All of nature isn't what God intended it to be at the beginning. In fact, you see that we're not going from better to worse, uh, or from worse to better like many of the evolutionists think. It, you see decay in the world. You know, I'm in the process of getting different car vehicles. Why? Because it decays and rust and all the things here. Creation is doing the same thing. And really, Paul, or, you know, God sums the creation. He said creation is, was subjected to futility, in my version. It was subjected to futility. Uh, he summed up the curse really in one word futility. You know, a, a tree goes up. A tree grows up and either burns or gets old and and dies and you see it laying in the woods and then it decays. And all different things, futility, frustration, some of your versions will say, or emptiness. The sin marred the goodness of God. Remember after God made the heavens and the earth, he looked at it all and said, it is very good. It is very good. But then sin marred what God called good. And creation ever since has been in a stage of frustration, of futility. It's not what God intended for creation to be. And he's just spending some time talking about the creation that you and I live around here today. And he said, but he said this about the creation. Creation was subjected to futility, but not willingly. (laughs) Did you imagine that? In other words, creation had nothing to do with it. It was our fault, but it was subjected to futility. Not by its own choice, but because of him who subjected it. In other words, God subjected the creation under the curse for now. But what? He didn't finish there. He said, with it, in hope. In hope. Subjected. Creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. In hope. <clears throat> In other words, the state that the creation is in right now is not going to last forever. It's not going to be like it is right now forever. God promised it, that one day it's going to experience a liberation. It's going to be set free from what? From the bondage of corruption that it's in right now. It just blessed me thinking about these things this week. I always think in terms of the human us, but Paul must have talked a lot about that in the Bible, about the creation suffering as well. Uh, The ultimate uh, destiny of creation is not annihilation, really, but transformation. I remember this old, uh, old test, or the <clears throat> professor teaching the book of Revelation one time. and He'd always say, remember, the Bible says, God says that he's going to make all things new. He didn't say, I'm going to make all new things. I'm going to make all things new. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. And, and what I believe, just like our bodies are going to be transformed, creation somehow, don't ask me how, is going to be transformed. It's going to go through a process. This creation that's groaning right now is going to go through a process and eventually of liberation from the corruption that it's in right now. That's encouraging, isn't it? I don't know how it all works, but I I found this just glorious to look at this week. 
He subjected it in hope. <clears throat> but he calls something here, he says in, in verse 19, he said, for the earnest expectation of the creation. Creation is in earnest expectation. It's, it's waiting for something. I couldn't think of really a good example for this, but I know maybe for a, a young lady, it's her wedding day. There's an eager expectation waiting for that day, or maybe you're going to have a baby and there's an eager expectation waiting for that child. Uh, there's an eager, I, I guess I'd always thought of a, a baseball game. You've maybe seen the cartoon. I don't remember, remember the picture, but there's a fence around a baseball field and kids go on to get in, but they don't have money, you know, and so they're, and there's a little hole in the, in the fence like this and a guy standing on a little wooden box or something, leaning with all he's got on top of his toes, just so he could take a little peek, putting his neck forward like that, just to see, to catch a glimpse of the ball game, what's going on inside. Just an eager expectation to see something. That's actually how the Greek says it is. It's like standing on your tiptoes and leaning forward with earnest or eager expectation. And he talks about this is what the creation is waiting for. It's longing for this day when it's going to be set free. And you know, often nature's personified in the Bible. That just means it takes on characteristics of a human. I'm just going to read some to you. I'll, if you want, you can write them down. But Psalm 90 or Psalm 96, verse 11 and 12 says, "Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound, and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant, and everything in them." Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy. Do you picture that? This trees in the field singing for joy. I know he already talked somewhere in the Old Testament. I think it was Isaiah that the morning stars sing together. I don't know. Pretty neat. Neat stuff. <laughs> and Psalm 98 verse 7 and 8 says, Let the sea resound, let everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Mountains and trees singing for joy. Isn't that neat? But you know, all of cre the whole creation was affected by it. The animal world as well was affected by the fall of man. You can tell things are out of sync when you read Isaiah chapter 11 and verses 6 through 9. I'm just going to read it. I think it's a picture towards the millennial period. Or the new heaven in Jerusalem. I don't know. But it, it talks about here in Isaiah 11, 6. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. Is that normal in the state we're in right now? That's not normal. The wolf shall be dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. There's fear of that now. I wouldn't let my kids lead a lion or anything like that, would you? Not in the state we're in right now. But there's coming a day when a child will lead them. He said, the cow and the bear shall graze. Imagine that. The young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat the straw like the ox. That's going to change, isn't it? The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. Then shall, <clears throat> they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Wow. You just say, wow, that's, that's nothing like we see. That's not the time described right the day which when we're living. But you can see now why there's an earnest expectation of the cre creation. How it looks forward to this day. Look in verse 22 back in Romans. And he says, we're not guessing here, Paul says, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. He says the whole creation. I think what he's talking about right now, everything God made except mankind. He's going to talk about the, us in a minute. He's talking about everything, animate, inanimate objects. I think everything God, the whole creation, he says, all of it. Paul says we know, God says we know, that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And it's still... Still that today in the day in which we live. Groans of pain. But they're not meaningless groans. Right? They're not groans of, of, of despair. 
Uh, in fact, on the contrary, really, they're, they, they said they're, they're not death pains either. He said they're childbirth pains. In other words, there's something coming out of this. Jesus even talked about it. He said a woman's going to have a child. She endures those birth pains and she forgets about them as soon as the son is born. There's a smile on her face. The labor pains bring forth something, don't they? And I think that's what he's talking about here. The whole creation actually is like in a groaning state right now, in pain. But why? Not death pains. Because there's something coming after. The child will be born, as it were. <clears throat> and so he says, creation eagerly waits for the freedom from bondage. Um, so suffering and glory are the things he's talking about both creation and now we're going to see God's children, us both creation and the suffering are suffering groanings now <clears throat> and both are going to be set free together uh, creation is waiting for the day that we are completely redeemed it's waiting for that day the revealing of the sons of God and as nature shares in the curse right now <clears throat> it's going to share one day in the glory along with us. And so that starts verse 23 of this chapter 2. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the spirits, even we groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Even we, and Paul including himself says, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Why? Because just like nature, we're not complete. We're incomplete. The way things are now. Our soul is redeemed. But our bodies have yet to be redeemed. Right? This is something to look forward to, man. The, the, the amount of funerals we've had, too. It's something to think about. That this isn't the end and the encouragement of it. We ourselves groan within ourselves. You know, <laughs> this week I, I was at wrestling practice and I injured my shoulder. I knew it right when it happened. And it felt good. I still had the motion, so I thought, this is pretty good. But by the time I got home and the next morning, to tea, I couldn't put my hand in my mouth. You know, that's, that's horrible. That's, that, was a, that would have been an unwanted diet, I guess. But uh, to not be able to put your hand to your mouth and eat left handed, I don't know. But <clears throat> as soon as I pull it to my mouth with two hands, though, then I could do it like this. But Shelly told me that, that I groaned all night. I groaned all night in my sleep. <laughs> I don't remember. Sometimes I wake up groaning. It hurts. We within ourselves groan within ourselves because of the corruption of this body, because of our sin too. But hey, uh, I'm glad this isn't the end. <laughs> we groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption Eagerly waiting. And if I, the adoption isn't finalized yet. It isn't finalized, really, I guess, until we have redeemed bodies to go with it. That's kind of the, the final element, really, of the adoption. So uh, <clears throat> eagerly waiting for it. Do you, do you think of it, though? I don't think about it enough so much that we eagerly, and especially you young kids, and man, you're happy with the bodies you got right now. <laughs> you don't feel the pain when you run, right, Michelle Kaiser? And you apply to play kickball and uh, you hurt your leg and injure yourself. The injuries we thought before, I, I can do this. And uh, realize that as I get older, I can't do the things I used to do. And so maybe you're not eager, but as life goes on, I find I'm more eager uh, for the redemption of the body. Um, God has a further plan, isn't it neat? He cares about the body, he cares about the soul, the entire you. <clears throat> and this is for the Christian, really. Because he says here, we also have, we, he's talking about we, so Paul himself, also have the first fruits of the Spirit. You know, when you were saved, you had the Holy Spirit, and it was like a down payment. A down payment or a pledge, which guaranteed the future completion of a purchase. In other words, I purchased you, I bought you. But that's the first installment. It's a guarantee that at the end of redemption, we're going to be redeemed. That's why we have this hope. It's not a I hope so hope. It's man, one day I know, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm going to have a new body. 
And we receive the first, uh, first fruits of the Spirit as a foretaste, really, and a promise of these blessings to come. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, if you want to turn there, Philippians 3.20. Look at how often in the Bible you find this theme that we're talking about. Philippians 3, and verses 20 to 21. <clears throat> but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a Savior. He, he waits, eagerly waits the redemption of our body here. We eagerly wait for a Savior from there. The Lord Jesus, in case you have any doubt who he's talking about, it's the Lord Jesus. He's the only Savior who by the power who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Our citizenship isn't here. It's in heaven. And he says, we're eagerly waiting a Savior from there. And what's it? What's he? Well, what's part of the expectation and eagerly waiting for him is that he's going to transform our lowly body. That's the one I got now. This is no glorified body, I'll tell you that. (laughs) And you know by looking at me. But he said he's he's going to transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. I don't know all the details. It doesn't give us all the details. But it's going to be a body like his. Uh, John, 1 John chapter 3. Let's just look there briefly. 1 John. Towards the end there. 1 John 3. Verses 1 and 2. We just quoted it. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it does not, did not know him. Beloved, now are we the children of God. Okay, no contradiction here. Now we are the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when, we, when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. It's a good reason to live a purity of life as well. But again, along these same lines. um, Going back to Romans, we'll finish up here. Verses 24 and 25. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what uh, hope for uh, what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. We, we hope for what we don't have yet. We know it's coming. It's assured to us. It's assured to us. God has promised us this. How many of you believe it? <laughs> we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. In other words, I think one of the main things he talked about in the first part with creation, eagerly wait, they're, they're eagerly waiting. They're waiting. They're in a state of waiting, a time of suffering, and we're to eagerly wait to be clothed with immortality. Uh, and we're supposed to wait for it patiently with perseverance. And uh, again, the fulfillment of this hope that we're talking about. <clears throat> Looking forward to that which we cannot see yet. I don't know what it's going to be all like, but God promised it. And it's going to be glorious, whatever it is. And so much so that God has promised us through Paul that you can't compare the two. The sufferings of this present time aren't even worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. He created man with glory, but he's going to, there's going to be a revealing that day. And our eyes are going to be uncovered to see things. And remember, I think it was last week he, we talked about that, where Jesus' prayer and the answer to his prayer, God, I want there to be where I am, that they might behold my glory, see my glory. It's going to be a, a day. <clears throat> so, so we need, I guess, to encourage us all. This is the time of suffering. We feel pain, and sometimes it seems overwhelming, and Paul said that too. He felt overwhelmed at times by it. 
But he, <clears throat> I think we need the biblical perspective to look at things the way from an eternal perspective, uh, to perse- help persevere through sufferings. <clears throat> we're we're going to encourage uh, uh, encounter it, loss, sufferings of different kinds. But here the encouragement is persevere, persevere. How are we going to do that? I'll keep an eternal perspective. These are the way things are now. There's pain, but there's coming a day when this is all going to be gone. And we we will, as the song said, we'll only look at it with a smile later on. If you want to turn with me for two more scriptures, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is a chapter about the resurrection life. First Corinthians 15 and verse 9, 19. For if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiful or most miserable. I like that one. If in this life only we have hope in Christ. In other words, if there's no afterlife, then it might as well be like it says in the Bible, right? Uh, in one place it talked about this. Eat, if there is no afterlife, eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. If, that, if that's the end of life, then yeah, why not? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But it's not. And Paul goes in and God goes through and explains the resurrection in this whole chapter here. And he gets to the end and he's talking about the victory over death. And he gets to the last verse of verse 58. He says, therefore, and therefore is everything he's pointed to about the resurrection. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. So what are we to do today in our suffering, in our pain, in our bereavement? What are we supposed to do? First of all, he calls us beloved brethren. Then he says, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. See, there's work to be done in this time. He says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And here's the greatest encouragement, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's not in vain. So what are we supposed to do during this suffering time? Be patient. Look forward, long for that day. Eager, expect. Like that boy just standing on on his toes, leaning forward to catch a glimpse of the ball game. We should have that same expectation of Jesus' return. And Hans keeps us balanced there, uh, remembering and reminding us often that Jesus is coming soon. But even if he tarries, we have a day of a resurrection of our bodies and so on. And he says, therefore, beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Again, I think that's an eternal perspective, keeping these things fresh in our minds. And I hope Denise doesn't mind me sharing it, but I I, I know when she's, I talked to her a little bit about when she lost her husband and so on. She said, well, obviously those are difficult, difficult days. But the thing that encouraged me, she said, I had more time to read my Bible. I had more time to study. I had more time to pray. And she got to know God in a special way during those days. And and it's been a help to her ever since. And uh, what a, God can turn something like this and, and teach us through it. But uh, we come to a day, even in these days of pain, with a longing expectation for that day to change. And I don't know, maybe we don't talk about it enough, but it seems like the early church, man, they look forward to this day. The transformation, the redemption of our body when these bodies are going to be redeemed. We're going to have new bodies, <clears throat> transformed bodies. And so but he says here, be immovable. There's going to be times that this is what the devil will use to up, upset your apple cart. These bereavements, these tough times to upset you. And he says, don't, no, don't be, be immovable. Be steadfast. And what should we occupy our time with? Well, I'll tell you here. He says, he says, uh, <clears throat> always abounding in the work of the Lord. Not sometimes. He says, always abound in the work of the Lord. God, God never has any un- unemployed Christians. <laughs> there's, there's work for every Christian. And so he says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And the encouraging part is that your labor, it, it'll feel in vain. At times, I felt at least that way. That's why I have to go back to this and remind myself what God says in his word is true, that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Isn't that encouraging? 
So whatever your labor is in the Lord, it's not in vain. And I think to help us through the tough times like this, you all need pink glasses. No. Some of you, nobody's listening. We were did true and false today. This is true, this is not true when we read in our Sunday school class today. And I didn't hear anybody say this wasn't true. But anyway. But as we go through this, let's persevere. But again, not as those who have no hope. There's those who have hope. And I'll tell you, as you get older and kids, you have no idea what I'm talking about right now. You just got up and you walked to church into church, maybe even skipped into this room. And Jim Crown used to do that too, but he doesn't do that anymore. He has to think about every step. So, And by the way, Jim Crown has a birthday coming up in another week and a half, and he'll be 84 years old. So we praise God for Brother Jim. And... Um, uh, he's one day going to get a new body too. Amen? Are you looking forward to that day? Amen. Bev, how about you? Yeah, looking forward. Eagerly expecting. It. Creation is waiting, but creation's waiting for us <laughs> to be totally redeemed. And I, I don't know what it's going to be like, but if this is glorious the way it is now, and yes, sin is what brings about the pain and death and suffering. It's all a result of sin. But there's going to be no sin up there. There's going to be no more sin, and that's henceforth no more pain. And things are going to be the way God intends it to be. And it's something to look forward to. And I think if we're not looking forward enough, and I speak this to myself, our eyes are too much on temporal things and not on spiritual things, and not on things above. Let's pray. Father, today we thank you for your word. <clears throat> we thank you that even now if our eyes were open to the groanings of creation, we would hear it longing for that day that it'll be clothed with immortality. We ourselves groan within ourselves. Lord Jesus, would you just help us through this life? I thank you that for the words of encouragement we heard today. You encourage us, therefore, since we have this expectation of a resurrected body, that we persevere through these days of suffering. <clears throat> that we patiently and eagerly long for that day. Eagerly waiting for you or the redemption of our body as well. Lord, help us to think of these things. Help us to live today with eternal perspectives. I don't know how it's all going to be, but I know if your word is true and I look forward to it, Lord. <clears throat> I just ask your blessing on each one as we leave from here, God, that you would bless the kids. Uh, Keep them, protect them, help them through school. <clears throat> help the mothers, Lord, that are pregnant. Help all the mothers, Lord, to raise their children. Help us as fathers, Lord, to live, raise our children and our families for, for you, Lord. And those that are retired, think of Bill and Bonnie traveling. And, uh, this week, would you keep them safe in their travels? Use them wherever they go in Florida or wherever we, uh, our path takes us, Lord. But thank you for your workings, Lord. Thank you for the, the people that have helped in the hurricane areas. And uh, thank you, Lord. We've prayed about these things. We've talked and you have moved and answered. And we, we want to thank you for it, Lord. And so just keep, but keep our eyes as we face the sufferings of this present world. To keep our eyes on eternity. As we say like Jonathan Edwards, Lord, would you stamp eternity on our eyeballs so it's always before us. The things we have and the things of this world, world are temporal. And so, Lord Jesus, we commit the rest of this week to you. Thank you that we can serve a God like you. And just ask for your help through it, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen and amen.